Welcome everyone, this is Tim Pullman and you're listening to the SEP Couch. This podcast is all about standard essential patents. We talk about patent strategies, friend licensing, patent pooling and patent litigation. So let's dive into today's episode. He is the founder and partner at Olarte Moray. I have here today with me Carlos Olarte. I'm very happy to have you here to discuss a little bit about the Colombian law and the Colombian cases that are going on right now on SEPs. Welcome, Carlos. Thank Tim. Thank you very much for the invitation. Really happy to be here. Awesome podcast. Uh, so let's get started. Really looking forward to this. Glad to hear you like it and you have been listening in. That is great. And it's even better that you are here now and we can hear some, you know, insights from you. And I always, you know, like to know more about the person before we start talking about all these topics that are important to us. So it would be great if you could get started and tell us a little bit about yourself, your career and what your law practice is doing. Um, sure. Um, I am a Colombian national now. I've been living here in Colombia since 93. Um, I uh, was raised in Peru. I'm also Peruvian. Um, went to a little bit of high school in the U.S. I studied biomedical and mechanical engineering at Duke University. Uh, I fell in love with patents at, uh, when I was 19 years old. I was a sophomore taking a mechanics course, and uh, my professor was a patent agent. And he uh, offered a patent class, uh, went to Alexandria, visited the patent office. It was actually in Crystal City back then. Nice. Um, fell in love with patents. He said, this is what I want to do. So uh, law school was a, an obvious option. So I uh, got my JD at uh, Chicago Kent okay. uh, in uh, Chicago. And at that point, I was actually thinking of working in the US. I would have probably become another US patent attorney. Um, but, uh, I got like a roots thing and I was born in Colombia, sent out a couple of cover letters and, uh, started working and worked for, uh, Baker McKenzie Bogota for 10 years. And then I set up shop in, uh, 2003. So, uh, Olarte Mori, the firm, um, is turning 20 next year. Really looking forward to that in the party. You're invited. Oh, wow. Um, and <laughs> thank you. And, uh, it's a firm that right now we started with seven people. We're around 220. We have five offices uh, in Colombia, in Bogota, in Cali, Medellin, uh, uh, Barranquilla. I'd love to have one in Cartagena. We don't. Um, and Bucaramanga. And we also have an Asia desk out in Tokyo uh, wow. with one of our partners uh, taking care of Asia from Tokyo. Um, my practice... Um, as uh, kind of mentioned to you before, um, started and still is uh, in pharma, prosecution and litigation, uh, and lately uh, telecom. Uh, and, and a lot of that is obviously SCP uh, litigation, um, which is obviously, I guess, what brings us to this uh, great podcast. Right. Exciting. Thank you, Carlos, for some insights here. And I you know, take you up on that invitation next year because I have been to Peru, but I've never been to Colombia. So it may be a good reason to go when you guys turn 20. But that's very impressive that you have started um, this business and that it has been growing so fast. And indeed, I would like to touch a little bit more and put more focus on, of course, your telecom cases. Um, and here in particular, of course, there was a quite famous case that I think started just a couple of months ago um, where Ericsson, Ericsson versus Apple um, uh, litigated some essential patents um, in, in Colombia. Um, it would be great. I'm, I mean, we all understand this is a still a pending um, litigation and there's certain things you cannot talk about, but it would be great if you could give us some background here, what happened um, so far um, in that litigation and uh, um, yeah, maybe also why Colombia? Sure. All great questions. I've been getting that last question a lot, the white Columbia. And uh, I think it's important to lay out a little bit of context. Um, the case you're referring to, the Ericsson Apple case, is a very novel case. Um, I would you know, be willing to, 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 to say, I think it's the first SEP case uh, in Colombia. Um, in that sense, we're a very junior 
jurisdiction to the other ones where SCP litigation has had already a relatively long history and um, is uh, well developed. Um, Colombia, you know, why, the why Colombia? I think uh, I would probably start with for procedural reasons, right? Why it would be interesting for a patent owner. Um, and so there's a couple of things. One, there's a very strong presumption of validity for patents um, for a number of different reasons. Um, but in essence, attacking the validity, and not just of patents, I would say in general regarding administrative acts, is a relatively um, lengthy, uh, uh, burdensome procedure, where, which you can do, obviously. Um, but it's a, it's a difficult procedure, um, and it's lengthy. And in the case of patents, it's very hard to obtain a stay of another proceeding, example, an infringement proceeding, right? Uh, while you discuss the validity. So in that sense, for example, if your you know, top defense is going to be in validity for purposes of Columbia, that's not going to be a very good strategy, right? right. Eventually, you know, there, you'll get to that discussion, but it's going to be very drawn out. Um, and at, you know, if you're for purposes of, for example, analyzing, you know, risk versus an injunctive, injunctive relief, you know, uh, your lawyer is probably going to tell you that's not a that's not a top defense. You know, it's not something we're really can, you know, hang our hat on. So um, it is viable, but we have very strong presumption of validity for that reason. Two, um, we have preliminary injunctions that can be granted if infringement, if a high, you know, if a likelihood of infringement, a high likelihood of infringement is shown and where you can you know, show that there's harm and delay in granting the PI. Um, and those are you know, relatively um, steep burdens that have to be shown before a judge, but it can be done. And in that sense, you can get preliminary injunctions for you know, regular patents and uh, as I'll mention for SEPs as well. Um, if you can show that those that standard has been met. Um, so obviously that makes it also very attractive. And I would say the third procedural reason too is um, if you need to obtain discovery, right? And typically I, I get, there's some surprise looks when I say this, because whenever people think of a civil jurisdiction like Colombia is, like the rest of South America is, great part of Europe is, um, they typically, the myth is there's no discovery. You can't ask for discovery. And, you know, maybe the French have some interesting alternatives uh, to obtain information. But Colombia curiously has had and continues to have very broad discovery. So that's also something that's very attractive uh, to any litigant, uh, to any plaintiff to obtain information, obtaining documents, obtaining testimony, um, site inspections, uh, all of that is available, um, and the bar is relatively low, right? Um, so, you know, the Americans start talking to me about fishing expeditions, and I'm like, yeah, that's kind of what it is a little bit. I'm sure eventually it's going to become a little bit more reasonable over time, right. but it's quite ample in Colombia. So I would say, you know, that's something that also makes us a very interesting jurisdiction to obtain information. And simply saying that the information is confidential, for example, is not going to be a reason why a judge blocks you. You know, they'll they'll come up with some creative protective orders for that information, but it is easy. So, you know, even for trade secret litigation, it's also becoming very attractive. And, you know, finally, I would also say that the timing, it's relatively quick. A first instance decision, including patent litigation, uh, absent some extraordinary circumstances, uh, should only take a year. Right. So okay. it's typically quick. And, and if you're talking about preliminary injunctions, it could be even quicker if, you know, the preliminary injunctions would essentially decides the case. So um, those are all reasons why I think uh, Columbia uh, became attractive. Now, uh, in the case of Erickson and Apple, I think, you know, the, the, the why Columbia, I think it's also an issue of, you know, where, where do I have my patents? Where can I assert my patents? And by just having them in certain countries, you, you file to obtain protection, right? So I think it's perfectly reasonable for 
um, a patent owner to say, if I can assert my patent in this jurisdiction, why not? You know, that's why I have my patent in that jurisdiction. Right. Um, you know, that's why any industry does it. And, you know, I started with pharmaceuticals, right? Pharmaceuticals, you know, makes a lot of sense. Local markets, I need my protection. Um, and it makes a lot of sense. And it, I saw this cycle also in some of my pharma clients, you know, where they would think, well, you know, why Columbia? But eventually, you know, they understood the benefits of this in litigation um, and started to use Columbia as a jurisdiction. The market is sufficiently big to make it interesting, certainly regionally in Latin America. Right. We're typically the third or fourth largest, depending how well Argentina is doing. Uh, and um, globally, um, you know, it's a very small market, but regionally uh, it makes some sense. And in the case of SCP litigation, you know, you're also thinking strategically worldwide, you know, what options you have to obtain effective protection. And fortunately, as in one case that we have in Colombia, Judge 43 uh, from the Civil Circuit Court in Bogota uh, took a decision to issue a preliminary injunction on a 5G uh, SCP, and that is currently in effect. And that is what's blocking uh, Apple from commercializing 5G compliant uh, devices in Colombia, including the, you know, the latest one that's coming out soon. Yeah, interesting. I think it's it's even the first injunction, preliminary injunction that was issued for that particular dispute, which of, we all know it's not only taking place in Colombia. Um, what I found also interesting that. Um, the decision even included that restraint from seeking anti-suit injunction in foreign countries. Um, and I did see also there were some, you know, attempts from Apple to kind of, um, you know, um, fight that preliminary injunction. C can you elaborate on that a bit, a little bit, um, and your opinion about that anti-suit injunction um, reference here? Sure. Um, that's, yeah, it, it is, um something that was reported quite roughly uh, around the world. Um, we do realize, we understand we're one of the first, um, if not the first case in that campaign. Um, the, um, that particular uh, situation, uh, Apple decided uh, to uh, object to the injunction. Um, and, you know, there, there's, if you will, procedurally um, ordinary uh, means of contesting the grant of an injunction. An injunction is automatic in, in Colombia, right? Um, a lot of folks ask me, you know, th th what does it take? And aside from presenting a bond, which a, a judge will typically request that you post a bond um, uh, for, uh, in, in theory, covering damages that could arise from eventually if it if it's considered that the pi was improperly granted that's yeah. what the bond is for but once you you, you pay that bond um you're going to get a preliminary injunction so it, it's fairly automatic uh there are no recourses that you can file to suspend the effects there's a couple of modifications made in the procedural law to make that clear because folks would you know sometimes file different types of recourses and judges would say oh maybe i can suspend while i decide the law makes it pretty clear now it's automatic. There's a couple of articles that, that, that say that. Um, that being said, then there's extraordinary remedies that you can uh, try to use in Colombia. One of those is called uh, tutela. And the tutela comes from our uh, 1991 constitution. And it was a way that was, it, it was a, a means, a legal means that was provided to um, persons whose who have had their fundamental rights um, deprived, right? They've been deprived of a fundamental right. Um, so typically that's the right to access to life, uh, to health, um, you know, pretty normally it's extreme examples. Um, the tutela in Colombia, just to give you like an idea, is most often used by patients that are trying to have access to some um, uh, health uh, request that they, you know, they've had a prescription and there's some issues with their HMO providing it. That's probably the most used uh, tutela in Colombia. But then it's also typical to have um, tutelas for, um, you know, human rights abuses, um, 
which you know we've obviously had a, a share of that in Colombia. Um, but it's pretty much you know for situations that are you know would be considered exceptional, extraordinary. Um, and uh, Apple used this uh, mechanism in an attempt to you know argue that the uh, PI was improperly granted. Um, and so, you know, you, saw, you had some reports concerning that, um, some interesting reports saying, you know, Apple's human rights have been violated and all that. Um, the judges, and, and this went up on appeal and eventually to the Supreme Court, um, that's already been decided. Tutela is something that's extremely quick. It takes yeah. 10 days to decide on first instance, 20 days for the second part, and the Supreme Court already decided that, you know, but, but I think 15 days ago. Basically, he said, you know, Apple, this is not, you're not the typical plaintiff for this sort of situation. Uh, the PI um, was properly granted. Um, and that's where it basically, you know, that's where the, the story ended. So, yeah, it was, I think, quite anecdotal, um, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but the PI is in place, right? Um, and uh, it's something that, you know, eventually, uh, the final decision will be taken as to whether or not it should be turned into a permanent injunction uh, as part of the um, decision on the merits that must take place um, by 2023, second semester. So okay. that's... Uh, interesting. And uh, what I also found interesting in the Colombian system, because I'm, I'm German, obviously, from Germany, that you also in Colombia follow this bifurcated system, like Germany, I think Brazil has it too, where you have validity and infringement in two different courts, right? Um, and that's also what you say, probably why the defense of, you know, invalidity is not a good one, because, you know, it's, it, it doesn't matter to the infringement case that much. And I, th I think that's pretty similar in Germany, but I kept hearing in Germany, especially from the licensee side, that that this may cause legal uncertainty or situations where maybe an invalid patent um, in that infringement case, you know, the court will, will, you know, eventually issue a preliminary injunction. And then you would have a situation where the patent, you know, that is actually invalid would be still used for an injunction. What, what is your opinion generally about that system? Is it still good and efficient and working well, or is it a case by case thing? You know, I think, you know, as in law, everything depends, right? So um, I see it as a, you know, wh where the needle is, right? So um, for Colombia, uh, it's very much in favor of the presumption of validity, right? Yeah. Which again, obviously favors the patent owner, but it does carry eventually some issues regarding what if you have a properly, improperly granted patent? And you can take the extreme example of, hey, listen, I have this piece of prior art that just kills novelty, right? Just obvious, you know, yeah. what do you do in that situation? And then you, on the other end of that spectrum, you have situations where it almost seems there's a presumption of invalidity, right? So, and with all due respect to my US uh, colleagues, I, I kind of see that sometimes in the US, right? Where, you know, with the creation of the PTAB and you're hearing, 85% kill rates that you can't avoid asking yourself that's that I don't was that the intent of that law or whatever so right. I think that's the other end of the spectrum I think you know being objective and fair solutions probably somewhere in the middle right um I like being on I like the needle where Colombia is right now but I do think eventually there there will need to be and probably this is going to take more case law being developed. Um, and there have been some attempts both at the Colombian level and more so at the Andean level. Um, our law is Andean law. So it's not just Colombia, it's Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, <clears throat> and Bolivia. Okay. And there's been discussion as to if we're gonna deal with invalidity, you know, as to how, and obviously everyone uses the, the extreme case to make it easy, right? How can we, have a proper discussion as to validity. Colombia, and I think it's important to note, this has a, a substantive discussion, which can go into the Andean law, but there's also a procedural discussion because this bifurcation, which we also have just as an example in Ecuador and Peru, right? The discussion in Peru, for example, you will have 
validity discussion before the same judge, right? So this, this that varies country by country. Uh, and coming back to, to Colombia, I think, you know, again, the needle, I think, is very much in favor of the patent owner. Um, in most cases, I see that's a good thing, right? Um, because I've also been litigating on the other side, not SCPs, but I've been on the other side. And I know what it's like to face, you know, situations where your client is telling you, you know, this is crazy. How did they get a patent on this, right? right. Which is, I think, to typically the reaction is on the defendant side always. But, um, you know, there's been situations where you see, uh, even in utility model cases, where it's even uh, more, you know, the, the potential uh, uh, for abuse, if you want to use that word, could be um, more is more obvious. Um, you know, you, you want to be able to offer reasons, and there is discussion, Tim, locally as to how that should be better dealt with. But currently, you know, what I've been describing as to where the needle is, that's where it is. But I think moving forward, it's probably going to start going more towards the center, and at least in the easier cases where you have something like lack of novelty, you may start seeing stuff like, for example, uh, the potential for staying the infringement action until some of the invalidity discussion is is, is had, like in Germany. I, I yeah. understand that's a possibility. Yeah. Um, so. No, right. But that's interesting. That's that's interesting to get some background on both sides, you know, and arguments. I think that's always good to get the full picture. Thanks for elaborating sure. here, Carlos. Um, what I, of course, would find interesting to understand also for this case better, um, because as you know, IPolitics, we um, typically are come in uh, at, at, at other levels where it's about the FRAN determination. So, um, of course, infringement, I understand that um, in a way has been established or there's some evidence at least that, that points in that direction. But more to me, of course, more interesting will be is there also going to be determination of Fran? And if so, in what shape will that come at a Colombian court? I think eventually, and, and, and just to underscore something in Colombia, just to make clear, the, the discussion uh, in most cases, and especially in SEP cases, is just whether or not an injunction is proper, right? So no one's asking for global Fran rate setting, uh, no, no damages. This is just uh, straightforward. Is there an infringement? If there is, I, 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 I'm seeking a permanent injunction. Right. If the parties can agree and license, obviously, I, you know, that automatically will suspend the effects of that. Um, but as far as the, the friend discussion, right, um, where I see that popping up is uh, on the merits when you start having a, a discussion, probably after the preliminary injunction stage in many cases, but at the preliminary injunction stage, you could have the discussion, the friend discussion in the sense of determining whether when, you, when you're doing that analysis regarding the equities behind granting the preliminary injunction, is, is there irreparable harm, right? And so that friend discussion will probably be had, maybe not looking at the specific numbers, but rather at the conduct, you know, the dance that the parties are having uh, when they're coming to the table. So, you know, when did they sit down? Did they wait till the last minute to negotiate? All right, license is over. Have you talked about, re at least use the word renewal? Right. Um, you know, how far along has the discussion, you know, come along beyond the offers themselves, right? Of which, you know, that's obviously always covered by an NDA. Um, so I think you're going to start getting some of that discussion, right? Um, and, uh, you know, because of, the situation in Colombia right now, it's ongoing litigation. Uh, I can't go into the details, but I think that discussion will start to take place um, uh, in, in Colombia. So um, the actual numbers, I don't see that uh, happening anytime soon. I right. think that's probably going to be handled by the more experienced uh, jurisdiction. And obviously those jurisdictions with judges that, you know, are willing to entertain that and uh, would like to take a look at that. No, that makes sense. Um, and in terms of, of course, um, I think many people in our industry have been surprised to see Colombia now on the map here. 
And it looks like the court has been acting very efficiently. I mean, in, in a few weeks, you get answers and decisions and preliminary injunctions. I think that's very effective, um, which in the other jurisdictions you typically don't have. And also in Germany, by the way, it's not easy to get an injunction there. Um, we, we always look at the data of, you know, we call it market coverage, and which is mainly the size of your family. And we look into the countries that you have protection and we weight these by GDP. And we have like an indication for that in our system. And you are right, there's there's you know, there's SEP holders that have a real global portfolio, also in jurisdictions that you may not have on your map typically. Um, these are typically what we call the net license source that you know, companies that would make more money with licensing than they have to pay. You know, most you know, companies are both sides, right? They have so the cross license, right? Ericsson included. Um, but they I would call them more a net license or, you know, they they make enough, enough revenue, more revenue than they have to pay, I guess. Um, but then the other side, huge companies that are more on the net licensee side of things, still owning a huge portfolio, their portfolios typically are not as global, as you said, they're more the IP5 global um, portfolio. So we, we make that observation in the data too. And also I looked before this podcast, I looked at the numbers over time and um, the numbers of filings in, the, in South America in general and also in Colombia that have been declared as SAPs has also been strongly increasing over the past 10 years. So there's, there is a trend to file also in South America more to find protection. And, and I guess it's also showing that those jurisdictions, you know, even if you say you're, you're early, uh, but you're mature in, in a sense that you have a very efficient system now. Tim, and uh, you just reminded me of another important point too, why Colombia is interesting, um, speaking about portfolios. It's very easy and quick, not easy, quick, to ramp up your portfolio in Colombia. Uh, Colombia is one, is a top five country as far as speed in granting. Wow. Um, and, you know, we have a system that provides for oppositions and all that, but um, you typically can get your patents granted in 20 to 24 months in Colombia. So um, I think that's also making Colombia very attractive from the moment you make the decision, you know, because obviously not everyone files in Colombia. Um, but if you do decide, it, this is not something that's super strategic or what are we going to start doing in five years? It's no, what can we start doing in two years? And if we want to start working a litigation uh, tactic campaign, you know, that lines up pretty nicely with two years um, while you while you start getting your patents in Colombia. Are you getting well, most so filings? Advantage. Are you getting most filings through the PCT um, applications of the WIPO? Is that how it works? Yeah, Colombia is a PCT, PCT member since 2001 and uh, practically all foreign filings. There's some exceptions if you're really in a hurry. Um, or it might be worth it, but otherwise uh, you, you come in through PCT. So, okay, so. that makes a lot of sense. But yeah, I think that that would have been also one of my questions, how efficient is, is that system? And I think that's important. Maybe another question on that is it, is there any way or, or is it similar to file like patents now in Colombia and the other Andean states, for example, like uh, Peru, Bolivia, you said, is that like a, I mean, language wise, I think it, that's for sure then the same, or I mean, at least not Brazil, but you know, from all the Spanish speaking countries. Yeah, like I tell my Brazilian friends, everything to the left on the map is Spanish, except for those little three countries to the right of Venezuela. So, um, you know, it, you know, from Mexico down to Patagonia, it's Spanish. Yeah. Uh, and in the Indian community, um, you know, we have a single law, um, but um, we don't have an, you know, a single patent. You don't have, you don't have a unitary patent. Right. Um, and each uh, office has its own patent office. So um, there's been discussion of an Andean patent, obviously, but uh, for now it's, it's four different patents if you want to patent across the uh, Andean community. But yeah, um, you know, having all Spanish speakers does facilitate costs, you know, as far as prosecution uh, throughout South America, definitely. Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, interesting what we saw in Germany, there's hardly no SCP in German language anymore, which has practical reasons. You know, if you draft your claims in English language that should be mappable to English language technical specifications, why translate, right? I mean, it's so much work to do that. And with the EP patent, which you can file in English language, which will be valid in Germany as well, 
you know, there, there's no need to have German local patents for SEPs at least um, anymore because you want to map them to an English document at the end, right? So claim charting is much harder with a German claim than with an English claim. Um, so it has sometimes very practical reasons, but we see that in the data. There's almost no German SEP declared, right? That's that's really what we see. Um, right. Yeah, and the, you know, as far as Spanish and and, and just the, the English language, um, the nice thing um, uh, as far as technical specifications and when you're doing claim mapping, obviously you you have to map to a Spanish uh, yeah. claim, but the language, the official language that's used at you know 3gpp and, and, and standardization in general is english so many of the words even though they're in spanish you know they they're the english word oh, uh, and so that does make mapping a lot easier uh when you have discussion you know, like with experts and stuff like that um it makes things you know much easier um uh, uh when you're when you're doing that exercise because many times in, in other fields uh, just even going to Spanish, uh, to, from English to Spanish, you know, there's words that change and that are difficult and that make litigation, you know, uh, more di difficult than it already is. So, yeah, that's definitely, I agree with that. Okay. Well, that sounds better than in China, I guess, because I hear that it's really difficult to translate everything to Chinese and then with all these different expressions, make sense of, of Chinese claims. But interesting. Mm -hmm. Great, Carlos. I think this has been great. Um, so many insights on Colombia, on, on SEPs, on litigation and all that. So thank you so much for joining this podcast. It was with a pleasure of having you. And I want to close off like with everyone who is here on, on my podcast to give you a, your final pitch, what you want our audience to keep remembering from you and you know from, from your experience with, with the law. Tim, thank you. This has been great. Um, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I think my, my, my key takeaway for, for today's uh, interview is, I think, the Colombian jurisdiction, um, why it's becoming attractive. Um, you know, we mentioned, we discussed a number of reasons, but I, I definitely think it is becoming uh, an attractive jurisdiction, not just for SCP patent litigation, uh, just for patent litigation in general. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting it to, to keep on growing and to see other um, active global uh, participants to come into Colombia and start thinking about uh, you know, using Colombian patent assets as part of their uh, global campaign. So um, I think that's my key message. Uh, I hope to hopefully see you next year in Colombia, Tim. And I'd also like to plug, uh, there's gonna be an interesting SEP panel at the, uh, Latin American Regional IP Attorneys Meeting, a SIPI, which is in Medellin during the first week uh, of December. So uh, if, you're, if no one's doing something after Thanksgiving, that's the week uh, to be in Medellin, and it should be an interesting panel. Great. I think there are good reasons to go there. Um, sounds really interesting, and I guess also the weather much better than in most Western countries <laughs> um, there, but that's great. That was Carlos Olarte. Thanks everyone for listening into this episode again, and I hope to hear you soon. Goodbye.